yesterday we were uh, discussing paper 1 of uh, UPSC 2023 main exam. Uh, now, I am uh, bringing to you paper 2 related analysis. Uh, so, when it comes to paper 2, uh, we have uh, more than uh, 95 percent of the questions that are on the um, expected lines. Uh, there can be, there are certain um, you know, terminologies that might uh, be slightly you know uncomfortable or the ones where a little more deeper study would have been required by the students. That is knowing what is the region to be considered with the Uttarakhand when it comes to prehistoric art. Um, the couple of uh, districts and, uh, and uh, sites if we know that that answer would be you know pretty much ok. Uh, but then the concept of bi-civilization is something uh, that must have hit the students like you no know, unless otherwise you have studied Indus civilization comprehensively that is uh, one question and then uh, the rest of them are like uh, yeah rest all the questions are on the expected uh, lines only and as I was mentioning to you in the last couple of batches to be prepared for uh, topics related to nationalism, nation building, etc. So, there was one this book that was published uh, in 2022 that is Nation Building in Indian Anthropology. Nation Building in Indian Anthropology. I see that uh, uh, this could be the basis of asking uh, the question this year that is this question number 7c elucidate the role of anthropology in nation building with suitable examples. So, I think the new publication by Abhijit Guha must have driven the examiner to give that particular question. <coughs> As the routine goes, uh, let us have a look at once again uh, two or three major things. One is how exactly archaeology figured out in the paper two. Second thing is how Indian society, meaning <coughs> largely chapters 3, 4 and 5, uh, how these three chapters were represented in the 2023 exam. So, it is from that point of view, if we are looking at archaeology related questions, you have uh, question number 1 in paper 1 <coughs> and uh, I mean 1A, 1D also in the same uh, question. And then you have uh, 2b that is uh, uh, Indus Valley by civilization related thing. You have uh, 3b Mesolithic if you recall in paper 1 also we had question on Mesolithic. Then uh, in section 2 you have the debate of Ramapithecus and uh, Siva Pithecus. Siwalik deposits <coughs> in 6c that is also one question on archaeology. Yeah, these are uh, largely the questions related to um, archaeology. Now, le let us look at the marks you have uh, 35, 50, 60, 75 marks in this particular uh, paper. And uh, if you could recall in paper 1, about 90 marks were there. So, 165 marks out of 500 from archaeology segment. So, that once again <coughs> brings out uh, the importance of archaeology. Now, if we are looking at chapters 3, 4 and 5 as an Indian society, let us have a look at the questions 1b, 1c. So, that is uh, 20 there. and. Uh, you have question number 2c from that segment and 3a is there and uh, yeah cast mobility as in 4c then you have uh, karma and rebirth in 5e you have annihilation of caste in 6 uh, yeah, so, there is this beautiful combination that is emerging like how in paper 1 we saw from three different segments he was giving questions in paper 2 also. We see that one question from tribe, one question from 
either demography or archaeology, one from you know, Indian society. So, the examiner is looking for your uh, command over the entire uh, syllabus. It is not that I do one segment of tribe and I can be comfortable writing section 2, it is not like that. Paper to Indian society related areas. You have uh, 20, 35, 55, 60, 70, 80, 100, 100 form the three chapters, 3, 4 and 5. So, I mean this kind of a <coughs> look at uh, the composition in terms of marks, you know that helps you understand where exactly you are supposed to focus. So, let me ha give you a quick look at the other things also, <coughs> like uh, ethnicity, uh, ethnopolitical movements, uh, concepts like nation building etcetera. We see a surge occurring in the last uh, couple of uh, years. So, you have one E that is where uh, social solidarity uh, based question has come and uh, you have uh, the question related to ethnic identity and ethnicity that is a 6 B. On the lines of ethnicity you can see in fact uh, Dra Dravidian languages also nevertheless I am not counting in that and uh, nation building. So, you can actually see three different questions coming up on three different uh, areas of ethnic identity. So, religion as a social solidarity, pluralism as social solidarity. You have one that is nation building in anthropology's role and the other concept that you have is ethnic identity and ethnicity. So, three questions from this particular segment alone meaning that um, it, it shows that publications are increasing and uh, UPSC recognizing the fact that these are the controversial issues till now you know not a major effort, major set of writings have emerged on this particular controversial thing in core anthropology. Now that things started to change they have to be reflected in your paper <coughs> that is how you know you can see. Let me uh, uh, give a brief idea about uh, uh, how exactly you are going to approach these questions and all. So, you have uh, the very first question that is material culture and uh, archaeology. So, basically cultural materialism studying culture with the help of material and ethno archaeology these two become very significant uh, areas to begin with uh, your answer related to material culture and archaeology. So, you may begin on the lines of cultural materialism second one is <coughs> Uh, largely study of uh, archaeology from the tools, artifacts, etcetera. So, that signifies. So, I divide this answer into two or three major segments. One is what constitutes material culture for archaeology, whether they may be artifacts, pottery, or kind of things you would be listing them out. And uh, so, basically, what uh, are the tools? Second one is the type of technology associated with the tools, because when you are studying material culture, material culture reflects plethora of other things that may be geological formations, that may be indicative of uh, social stratification, that may indicate the level of uh, evolution that is technological evolution of the society. So, when I am saying this, you are actually trying to indicate one is what is the material culture and uh, what is the nature of material culture. Thirdly, what the material culture indicates, whether that is social stratification, gender specificity, etcetera, etcetera. And uh, then, <coughs> what are the various research methodologies, meaning is it a stratigraphic method or are we uh, in a position to use uh, anything like absolute dating method. So, I think in this particular answer you may perhaps give a small table incorporating what are the uh, <coughs> materials and what kind of uh, research methodologies or dating methods can be used to date that particular tool or fossil kind of a thing. 
And when we are doing all this, you may perhaps bring in uh, you know, popular thinkers, one from the global anthropology, one from Indian anthropology, like Bhattacharya can be got in, or uh, H. D. Sankalya can be got in, child's theory of evolution could be got in. But then, hmm, this is how it is. You have the other question from uh, Indian society. Uh, namely Purushartha and Ashram, Purushartha and Ashram, the interface between them. Uh, basically, because this is a philosophical, Hindu philosophical uh, related question, um, you may perhaps uh, begin by talking about uh, the moral code, Hindu Sanatana moral code, which actually prescribes the major objective of uh, uh, the practitioners of uh, Sanatana Dharma. So, this actually indicates the objectives of one's own life and uh, this talks about the stages of life and the effort that you put in different uh, parts of your life. So, basically this indicates uh, the path and the goal and uh, this indicates the steps through which one can actually achieve those goals. Now, when we talk about this Purushartha and Ashram, your uh, answer should talk about at least one picture you can incorporate where you know, the Chaturu Ashrama system from Brahmacharya to you know uh, Sanyasa. In this particular uh, vicious circle, how the Purushartha actually influence? So, basically speaking Dharma, the Purushartha, uh, then you have uh, Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, Sanyasa, as one is going from one stage of life to the other, how Grihastha is actually influenced by Dharma, Artha and Kama. Whereas, uh, after sannyasa, you have a possibility of moksha based on whether the individual is able to deliver his duties according to dharma. So, basically, the which are the purusharthas that uh, are necessary to be given importance to in each of those ashramas, that becomes the discussion point here. The, this picture, if we are elaborating, uh, that makes uh, the relevant answer. But then you see, uh, we should also look at, we should also look at what is the contemporary significance of uh, the interconnection. At a time when uh, science questions uh, everything that is under the idea of religion, etcetera. So, that is where we will have to talk about in what modified form Purusharthas, especially the Purushartha of Dharma, Purushartha for Artha and Kama, how exactly they got modified in a changed scenario of ashram systems. And uh, so, with that significance, you should actually close. So, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> this is a, a very age old and simple kind of a question, Jajimani system continuity and change. So, basically in the initial paragraph itself, you would be talking about how Jajwani system more or less had become uh, survival of the past. I mean with that you may begin and uh, a basic explanation of Jajwani system can be given by using maybe you know Dian Majumdas pictures or you know how the other people that may be Harold Gould, how they have picturized uh, the whole thing what Iravati Karve had to offer, Saraswati had to talk about Jajmani system, uh, how I mean, so you can actually go in a pointed format, um, I mean the kind of economic relations, the kind of ritualistic relations between them and you may perhaps also talk about uh, uh, how uh, Jajmani system was uh, reflecting the organic nature of the caste system and interfamilial uh, dependence. Having said that, uh, the equal amount of importance you should be giving in your answer to change in the Jajwani system. So, what are the factors? So, this is more or less like a mechanical kind of an answer you are writing. Uh, 
the entire information related to Jajwani system, but trying to write in a pointed format so that you are meeting the requirement of. So, <coughs> that is how things are. Uh, basically, when we are talking about prehistoric uh, art forms of Uttarakhand, we are referring to um, the regions of Almoda, where uh, we see, you know, pictographic uh, drawings or petroglyphic drawings. So, basically, uh, we will have to reflect on the little tradition of uh, this region when it comes to prehistoric art. Because uh, that is uh, a time uh, which was reflecting uh, various narrations of a culture of the time. And also, we can see that uh, over a period of time, that particular region was reflecting uh, certain changes, social changes, religious practices that uh, were very much visible in the art form culture. So, basically, this region which was earlier a larger part of the state like uh, UP, this gained significance after the creation of Uttarakhand and then those two or three major sites that emerged as a major uh, you know, area of attraction for, um, for uh, prehistoric archaeology, prehistoric art. So, basically, uh, one of the ways in which you may be beginning your answer or concluding your answer is comparing this with Central Indian uh, um, prehistoric art, like when we talk about uh, Bhimbetka. So, comparing Bhimbetka with uh, the two or three sites of Uttarakhand, that can give you a better understanding of in you know, a comparative study of art form culture. That is one. And uh, you have this other question, religious pluralism and social solidarity. The thinker that should, uh, you know, be incorporated in this answer definitely has to be S.C. Dubey, because that was the theme of his uh, study in uh, Shamirpet, where he was talking about building uh, how exactly the Hindu and Muslim communities of the region were having the social solidarity despite differences in religion. So, that is where, uh, you know, we talk about certain two types of things in religious pluralism. One is solidarity within each religion. Second one is solidarity across the religious groups. And uh, when it comes to solidarity within the religion, that would have a negative tendency of, you know, provide, uh, leading to a partisan attitude or uh, polarization of uh, the society that one can see in the context of political aspects in the contemporary times as well. And that is what Dubey was also making a mention. Second thing is, due to various mechanisms, cross-cultural relations, etc., that is where religious uh, pluralism may lead to cross-religion uh, social solidarity. And that is where much more powerful mechanisms like, you know, nationalism, regionalism, etc., they prevail as, uh, you know, ethnic boundaries to lead to social solidarity. So, uh, in the context of social solidarity of uh, religious groups, you shall also incorporate uh, readings of Yogindar Singh, where he was, uh, you know, emphatic about how different religions from within the country or outside India, how they have led to strengthening of the of uh, the ethnic boundaries. You have the other question, which uh, I've been waiting for quite a, a good amount of time, that is tribes as backward Hindus, a very popular statement given by G. S. Ghuri. So, basically, we see uh, in that context, basically in this context, uh, we see that uh, Ghurye was trying to incorporate, Ghurye was trying to incorporate culture contact based on which how tribes can be categorized. In this culture contact, he is more emphatic about Hinduization. So, categorization of tribes based on the level of Hinduization. And uh, this becomes a very huge statement, 
this also led to another argument, popular articles were there, or all tribes Hindus. So, it is in this context what you should be writing is uh, more or less a discussion related to tribe caste continuum, wherein uh, he was giving examples of uh, tribes at uh, different levels of Hinduization. So, the ones that are totally absorbed into Hindu ways of life, the ones that are resisting or uh, hmm, the ones that are a via media between. So, kind of things, when we talk about these, uh, not to forget how Gurye can be appreciated for uh, giving tribal ethnographic profiles and uh, across the country taking examples to discuss specific social institutions that can be, that can be political institutions among tribes or uh, economic dependencies among tribes and caste groups, etcetera rituals, beliefs and all that stuff. So, when he is actually trying to explain the connections between tribe and caste, um, based on which he is coming to that statement that tribes are backward Hindus, that was taken controversially by a section of anthropologists. But according to him, uh, most of the tribes are Hindus because of the sheer size of Hindu population in the country. And that is where he was uh, uh, emphatic about the level of uh, Hinduization. Then you have, uh, so basically that is how it is. And for all the questions, make it a point that, you uh, know, as I always keep saying, contemporary relevance is important. So, how exactly Gurye's statement becomes a contemporary relevant? So, um, if at all religion is the basis of study here, we will have to check in uh, <coughs> how the religious demographies are changing among the tribes. Are there any other influential factors like westernization, etc.? So, in order to see the contemporary nature of the tribal societies, uh, this uh, Guria's work also becomes important. Other questions here, which I am looking at those that require uh, some bit of uh, analysis. You have question 3a here, which mentions that uh, Sanskritization is a culture bound concept and uh, critically comment to assess the strength and limitation of this concept in developing theoretical framework to study social change. So, cutting short, <coughs> he is talking about Sanskritization's limitations. The statement shows that it is a culture bound concept, meaning it is a concept that in a way is linked to Sanskritic society or the so called Hindu society. And there are good lot of uh, you know, critiques that one has to bring in. So, I think uh, that is a pretty much a direct kind of a question. Then in the introduction, you may talk about Sanskritization as a indigenous process of social change, as was uh, mentioned by um, Yoginder Singh. Indigenous process of social change, uh, others being westernization, secularization, etcetera, which might have come from outside. <coughs> So, this is an indigenous process according to him. And uh, when he talks about culture bound concept, you will have to mention how the social stratification is actually scaled by people. Uh, the kind of objectives people were having, like based on the, the, the model to be emulated, whether you call it Brahmanical model or Kshatriya model, etcetera, which is much more you know culture bound with respect to Indian Hindu society. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you, you are you are trying to give the limitations of studying social change. One may be that uh, the lack of uh, lack of assurance of Sanskritization as a mechanism of achieving social change, and uh, that's where uh, the entire discussion given by M. N. Srinivas should come into picture. And uh, Sanskritization is also criticized for neglecting the outsider's influence and that is where he talks about westernization. And uh, certain things that he was very categorical about, such as you know among the models of Sanskritization, the 
uh, for him initially there is nothing like an untouchable model or the Sudra model, etc. and how these have emerged in the later times, the adding comprehensiveness. So, when I am saying this, do not simply look at the concept from the negative angle. Uh, he is asking for both strengths and weaknesses, uh, strengths and limitations. Maybe perhaps you can go in a pointed format that would do good and huge lot of information you will be able to accommodate. So, the basic uh, terminologies, basic names of the thinkers like you know M and Srinivas are, are more than necessary. See, this is one very interesting thing, which if you remember in the classroom I was mentioning regarding Mesolithic culture, I said uh, Mesolithic is a springboard towards uh, the development of Neolithic culture. So, in a changed format this gentleman is asking, that is how Mesolithic culture uh, was the first step towards sedentary way of life, meaning the emergence of agriculture basically. How Mesolithic was the first step. So, what we have discussed there about this being a springboard towards Neolithic, there are certain Neolithic characteristics that may be full time villages, full time agriculture, food grains, shift from you know hunting gathering to sedentary lifestyle etc. When we are talking about all that, uh, out of them the crux here is uh, coming from emergence of sedentary way of life due to agriculture. <coughs> And that is where we should call, we should be incorporating several site references. In the paper 1 also, I was trying to mention several sites from Indian Mesolithic based on the regional finds that may be Lothal or Bimbetka, etc., or Sarai Naharai kind of sites where you find uh, no, beginnings of agriculture. So, that may be, you know, uh, presence of uh, um, handmade pottery or presence of uh, thatched material for storage or it could be emergence of certain food grains. Uh, the variety may not be so huge as the Neolithic, but then there is always that presence of certain food grain varieties. So, you should be in a position to incorporate uh, these. I mean based on such kind of phenomena, that is one is agrarian things, second one is settlement pattern. So, what is cultivated settlement pattern and the kind of tool typologies as we see that uh, in certain regions we saw the emergence of scrapers of the Neolithic or uh, sarsen stone of the Neolithic. So, these actually indicate that uh, Mesolithic was a stepping stone towards the sedentary life of the Neolithic. Uh, when it comes to this particular question, examine the impact of uh, modern democratic institutions on contemporary tribals. It is here that uh, your answer must totally depend on what Vidyarthi had uh, mentioned in this particular context. So, that is where he was trying to categorize the tribes based on one that is peaceful transition, there is an aggression of limited variety and then outright you know um, outright uh, questioning of the of the government and then anti-governmental uh, establishment uh, kind of a setup and then uh, it, it may be the revolts you know, which, which may incorporate a violent kind of response against the government. So, he was trying to indicate this. So, in these three categories, that is what is your answer basically, what is the impact of modern democratic institutions. So, how are the relationships between the tribal panchayats and the modern, modern panchayats, that is what is being narrated here in this particular question. So, that is where tribal cultures of India by L. Vidyarthi can be of great help to you. And then, so you can give several examples that may be Bills or Gones or several northeastern uh, regions or how um, the Koyas accommodated themselves, Gones accommodated themselves. So, PVTG policy is uh, quite a direct one. And then you have another question, namely Risley's and Sarkar's approaches to the classification critically compare. So, basically you are uh, comparison, let me give you a basic uh, structure about this. 
two thinkers are there, Rusli versus Sarkar. And the question is about critically compare the approaches to categorize. So, it is not simply about what was the classification, it was about the approach as well. So, in that sense, you may talk about the sampling, which is much, you may begin by, you may begin by appreciating Risley as the major originator of anthropometry in racial studies. Sarkar, who tried to redefine and try to accommodate multiple aspects in racial classifications, in drawing Indian racial types. So, sampling could be one and then tools adopted what I mean by tools is, what was the content they were trying to use for racial classification. So, if it was Risley, most often he was trying to look at the, the morphological and physical characteristics and then the measurable ones rather nine different criteria that he takes, certain measurable ones and certain you know, visually perceivable ones. So, basically uh, the first usage of uh, anthropometry kind of. Now, when it comes to Sarkar, Sarkar was having a combination of various socio-cultural aspects, including uh, rituals, belief system, food habits and all that stuff, in addition to um, anthropometry and his focus was largely on head forms. So, he revolutionized the racial classification systems of India. That is where we see that uh, uh, he was trying to incorporate uh, several uh, methods of uh, concluding on the head forms and rather than depending on one particular uh, way of uh, measuring. Having uh, done this, you can perhaps give the basic uh, classification of each of them, basic classification of each of them and what Sarkar had questioned uh, the basis of dolichocephaly of Indian population dolichocephaly of Indian population or the existence of uh, brachycephaly So, basically how Sarkar was in a way trying to uh, criticize Risley, but then it is not the vice versa. Sarkar's criticism we can actually give from uh, the uh, uh, neutral perspective, not exactly from Risley's point of view, but then that is how things are. So, when we are trying to conclude, you may perhaps bring in something like uh, what is the relevance even today of each of those schemes, uh, because if head form is the central theme of reading um, about uh, any culture group, their uh, intellectual capabilities, etcetera then uh, Sarkar's categorization would be of great use, whereas Risley is a more comprehensive one. Then uh, you have the other question here, I mean this is also pretty much expected one, caste mobility is it a recent phenomena in the light of Indological and empirical. So, the question is caste mobility, that is where you see two people coming up, K. S. Singh was there and then M. N. Srinivas. Srinivas was trying to talk about caste mobility from the ancient times, that is pre-British times and British and post-British. So, basically when you are trying to answer the first question is caste mobility a recent phenomena. It is not a recent phenomena, but it was there even prior to the British, British and post-British also. But the thing you should be incorporating is the mechanisms of caste mobility were changing from time to time. But the fact that 
mobility of the caste uh, is, a, is a reality, that uh, is, is a confirmed fact. So, you can stick to M. N. Srinivas alone, when he was trying to give examples, how in the ancient times, the role played by the kings in awarding land uh, donations to people, and then uh, appointing them as uh, small time landlords or rulers, and then uh, uh, recruiting the soldiers, etcetera, then Kshatriyaization happens. So, basically, you are talking about what are the mechanisms in the pre-British, and during the British time, uh, how censors, westernization, strengthening of Sanskritization kind of things, how they have mod helped the modification of uh, uh, Indian social stratification. And then the third one is, in the post-British times, developmental schemes or education, faster migration, and welfare state, all these factors, how exactly they got. So, you need not have to worry about whether my second part is getting answered in this. In fact, you do not try to segregate the two. <coughs> Your examples are largely uh, to be incorporated in the explanation of the first one. Now, let me take you to the second section. See, this time, uh, I mean, the, the challenge the students were facing was that all the questions more or less they knew the answers, and then which one to choose is, is, the, is the issue. And that that is how your preparation has to be. This is a run of the mill kind of a question, scheduled uh, areas, meaning whatever constitutional position is there, whatever uh, powers of the governors are there, what um, policy making, and then the level of involvement of people. And this is uh, more or less like a, a general answer you would be writing from general studies. I mean, I am not getting much into that. Let me look at this Siva Pithikas and Rama Pithikas debate. As most of you know, that these two are the gender variants of the same species. So, here you will have to indicate that despite the debate, these two have been instrumental in giving this uh, higher significance and value to Indian archaeology, in the context of emergence of uh, ancestors of genus Homo. Because they are the earliest kind of evidences that we are finding. Having said that, you will have to give, in the first paragraph itself, the debate has been, whether they are two different species or they are members of the same species with gender differences. In the, in the initial uh, statement itself, you make it pretty much clear. And then you talk about, what are the features, what are the physical characteristics, evidences of Ramapithecus and Sivapithecus. And uh, you can perhaps uh, also incorporate the debate of Dryapithecus, because right now these two are seen as the subspecies within Dryapithecus family. And uh, yeah, um, the larger conclusion and location of Siva Pithikas as an ancestor of orangutan, not in the human evolutionary line, that should come into picture. So, two controversies here. One is, whether these two are different or one, in terms of species. Second one is, where exactly they are located in the phylogenetic picture of Homo sapiens. That is one. And then you have uh, the other question, the statement of Charles Metcalf, villages, villages as republics, little republics, village as a little republic. So, basically two people you will have to incorporate, Charles Metcalf, because he was the one who gave it that, that particular concept in anthropology extensively that was being used. When he says as little republics, he is talking primarily about the self-rule. And uh, what are the various social dynamics that were affecting, what were the social dynamics that were affecting um, the, the you know, social uh, life of uh, the villages, where uh, power equation becomes prominent ones. 
and uh, having said that, I was thinking that uh, it is better if you could incorporate uh, certain things. One is, I am trying to stick to the, the statement of little republics. So, when Metcalf says that uh, this concept is actually creating republics of uh, Indian village, in a way that uh, he is talking about political uh, autonomy, how political autonomy was executed at one point of time in the villages and how with the modern constitution things started to change. Basically, when Metcalf was mentioning, this later constitutional development was not there. But when Srinivas was writing or uh, when, when actually people like uh, Alan Beals were writing, Mahatma Gandhi was trying to look at it. There was, there was a, a friction that was emerging, that is the self-governing villages were now to be absorbed into um, the state, if at all we can call you know, villages folk kind of a thing. So, your answer must talk about what Metcalf's opinions were. Secondly, how Gandhi looked at it or Alan Beals had looked at it and then Andre Betelli had reacted to this particular phenomenon of village as a social system of little, little republic. In that context, in the, in the contemporary times, we see that uh, village no more is like, you know, uh, no more is totally self-determining, self-reliant, because there, there are connections there, there are interconnections there. So, it is in this context the debate of democratization and delegation of powers for the self-governance that becomes a controversial issue. So, you are basically trying to conclude that as a part of agrarian social structure studies and uh, village political studies, what transpired now is politicization of villages and politicization of, of the core of the village that is caste. And uh, thirdly, the, the controversial connection between, between uh, traditional panchayat and the modern panchayat. Fourthly, how exactly realistically delegation of powers is happening to the villages, so that uh, their self-dependence and self-reliance would remain. So, it is more or less a topic of sociology. Uh, unfortunately, more writings on this particular issue have come in the post 1970s in sociology, by which time in Indian, um, by, by which time anthropology of India especially was uh, almost keeping aside the simple societies discussions etc. So, it is more a contribution of sociology and sociocultural anthropology rather than core anthropology. So, that is where we can actually talk about and you say that that reflects the changing preferences of the of the exchequer, changing preferences of the government. In fact, uh, one of the critics was mentioning this, when uh, we talk about uh, village as a little, little republic, we are more or less uh, fantasizing and romanticizing the rural life, which is actually not so. The Ravidian languages and their subgroups, this is a pretty direct kind of a thing you are trying to mention Grierson, Grierson's, uh, Grierson's uh, categorization of uh, Dravidian languages that is into you know southern uh, Dravidian, northern Dravidian or. So, basically uh, in uh, Dravidian uh, languages, um, we are we are trying to look at Grierson's classification, the traditional classification and how he had looked at uh, Southern Dravidian, Eastern Dravidian, Western Dravidian, etc. So, basically you are trying to give the flow chart of uh, Grierson and what is the percentage of uh, Dravidian speakers. You also should give the map, because in the map related to Dravidian languages, you see a trace of Dravidian language in the northwest frontier region and that becomes an interesting area of uh, you know, writing for you, number one. Second thing is, I also insist that uh, second linguistic survey, second linguistic survey, uh, which uh, was the, the, the one that was released in the last decade. How exactly second linguistic survey tried to address Dravidian 
um, languages uh, with less focus on the smaller language groups that is the tribal languages um, where the, the, that was the expectation rather the, the expectation was to study what are the factors associated with the, with the fall of them or disappearance of certain languages etc so on that uh, some some uh, uh, no, uh, discussion you may perhaps raise in order to bring a comparison of grierson and the second linguistic survey it's like an you know, exhibition of your knowledge whatsoever people generally write grierson classification only even that would do but then i want you to incorporate um, the contemporary thing as well the next one is a pretty direct kind of a thing namely karma and rebirth karma and rebirth a huge uh, hindu concept which was actually used by the you uh, know protestant hindu religions like uh, jainism and buddhism as well so that actually talks about uh, the connection between this world samsara and the other world uh, where uh, the interconnecting things so karma and rebirth are interconnected through one very important medium that is dharma so if karma and dharma are matching with one another there is no rebirth and hence there can be moksha and if karma and dharma are not matching then there is a possibility of rebirth i mean this is the crux of them that is where we have huge lot of literature you may perhaps uh, write agnavalkya's uh, philosophy or manu's philosophy various upanishads like kaushitaka upanishad etc that actually talk about the connection between them so uh, here <coughs> we have to in the first paragraph itself pretty much make it clear that moksha is possible only if karma and dharma meet otherwise you know there is a rebirth now we will have to focus more on what kind of karma might result in what kind of rebirth that is where the whole lot of manu's explanations would come into picture what kind of bodily sins mental sins verbal sins etc that would lead to one particular kind of a birth kind of things and then perhaps contemporary relevance also you would be trying to incorporate i was actually looking for this particular question i mean i was asking students to peep into this book also annihilation of caste by dr b r ambedkar so is annihilation of caste possible so basically um, this is a question related to uh, what were the mechanisms suggested by dr b r ambedkar and what he was suggesting was it really true was it really possible so discuss the future of caste system in the light of various proactive measures taken by the indian state so in the um, in the first uh, instant is annihilation of caste possible you will have to bring in the mechanisms that were suggested by dr ambedkar thus for him the entire caste system has to be uh, ha has to be you know put aside uh, has to be dealt with in a particular manner so that the evils of caste system can be eliminated namely the untouchability because that cannot be possible uh, at a single stroke by a political office the constitution of india has come up with uh, various step by step uh, mechanisms in order to annihilate the caste system or to reduce the vagaries of the caste system and that is where you may perhaps talk about the future of caste system in the light of various proactive measures when we say proactive measures there is an there is more focus on education equality or creation of the jobs etc etc these actually were trying to bring uh, a, a, the aim the, the, they were actually trying to fulfill the level playing field kind of a thing for uh, people of different uh, varieties and that is where in a future of caste as was discussed by either ghuria or emin srinivas has to be spoken about like how caste may be loosening its strength in certain ways and strengthening in certain other ways on those lines you can perhaps uh, conclude and then you have this very beautiful question distinguish between ethnic identity and ethnicity 
and discuss the factors responsible for ethnic conflicts in tribal areas. There are two components here. One he is mentioning is ethnic identity and ethnicity. <coughs> See, ethnic identity is, uh, is, is a mechanism, is a criteria uh, of ethnic boundary. So, that gives an identity to the group of people. So, it is an ethnic boundary. Ethnicity is a strong V feeling that is the result of the identity somebody is uh, claiming. I hope it is clear. So, ethnicity is the result of claim of these ethnic identities. So, that is where what are the I mean in the in the first paper also you had seen this question um, based on Frederick Bath's uh, you know writings on ethnicity and ethnic boundaries and uh, that is what once again you can bring in ethnic identity is a more, more uh, a fluid entity. It may change from time to time, from place to place, from individual to individual and among the individuals themselves. It is a more temporal and spatial thing and that shows that the basis of ethnicity is also very dynamic. And um, in anthropology in general and Indian anthropology in particular, we see that uh, ethno-political movements and ethnic conflicts that is where again you will have to talk about K S Singh. K S Singh makes uh, this discussion, he gave this discussion of what are the factors responsible for ethnic conflicts among the tribals. So, when I am talking about uh, K S Singh, what I insist is that you try to incorporate whatever reasons he is trying to indicate. Because there cannot be any better way of presenting this answer than using K S Singh. So, K S Singh what he does is pre-independent mechanisms, pre-independent factors of uh, no, tribal movements or ethnic conflicts among tribes versus post-independent mechanisms, post-independent factors. So, I think uh, that would do good and when he was trying to give each reason, he was also parallelly trying to give uh, example for each reason. So, if at all losing of the land rights is one, which tribal communities uh, revolted on that or losing of the religion is one or thrusting of the mainstream religion or maybe perhaps uh, the, uh, the high handedness of the landlords and contractors etcetera. So, when I am mentioning this, so K S Singh is the beautiful you know way of expressing uh, that. So, he is a contemporary writer and uh, current and uh, um, during the British and early post British examples can be incorporated. And maybe perhaps you can uh, in the process of conclusion, you may try to incorporate two or three major things like you know how um, people centeredness or anthropo uh, anthropological people centered. Uh, approach towards tribal problems can can help us uh, reduce the kind of conflict and strife. You can incorporate uh, Vidyarthi's comments or uh, Chattopadhyaya's comments, you can write about K Singh's comments on how exactly to. Siwalik deposits, so a variety of neogene fossil primates. So, basically uh, when we talk about uh, Siwalik fossil, Sivalensis is there, that is Sivapithecus and then in much later times we have uh, other hominid fossils emerging. Basically this was a question uh, that seemed to have been modified from something else that was asked before, significance of Siwalik in primatology, significance of Siwalik in the study of human evolution in uh, Indian subcontinent. So, when we talk about neogene fossil primates, it means that uh, uh, whatever um, the more recent and contemporary kind of finds that have come from Siwaliks, that is where he is trying to focus it. But then everything said and done, the central theme of the question is uh, how Siwalik deposits, how Siwalik region is important in tracing human, ev human evolution. So, that is where uh, you may perhaps talk about uh, 
uh, <coughs> you may perhaps talk about number one, what are the varieties of fossil primates that we have found, right from uh, uh, early pleist pre pleistocene times to uh, the emergence of early homo sapiens, this is one, uh, the varieties. And then secondly, what are the challenges Siwalik region has, whether in terms of uh, stratigraphy or vulcanization or uh, riverine uh, you know, deposition or erosion kind of things. So, basically um, the geological information of Siwaliks that becomes a major challenge. On the other hand, uh, you may perhaps talk about the techniques that are used, a comparative method, a combination of uh, absolute and relative dating that could actually confirm uh, the specific fossils. And other kind of challenges you find is uh, the evidence is uh, largely, you know, migrated, you know, only partial evidence is existing. So, it becomes a challenge for anybody to conclude on the evidences. Nevertheless, Shivalix has always uh, been a very important area of Indian studies, because you have homo erectus evidence, you have you know pre hominin evidence and homo sapien evidences. So, that is actually you know positively speaking Shivalix, if it was not there, it would have been very difficult for us to make any kind of a larger conclusion on existence of human evolutionary past in India. Basically here, uh, this is a question about evolution of tribal policy, evolution of uh, tribal policy. So, when we say evolution of tribal policy, one major uh, uh, component is forest policies. One is forest policies. The second one is PISA, that is scheduled areas. Act, uh, hmm. Uh, so, a lot of attention has to be given in this question to uh, forest acts, shifting terrains of India's tribal policies in colonial and post colonial times. So, uh, you can perhaps go for forest policies and then PISA Act, you may talk about uh, exclusive, excluded and partially excluded areas related to discussion. Uh, and then uh, you may talk about uh, uh, tribal sub plan approach that had come in the post independent times in devising mechanisms of uh, tribal development. So, these three four major things, but then a higher importance has to be given to, uh, to forest policies, there is no doubt about it. But then be cautious, do not restrict yourself to forest policy alone. And then another direct uh, question with good lot of uh, examples. I tried to give a huge lot of examples on power projects and hydroelectric projects related to displacement in the tribal anthropology book that was circulated to you as a part of your course. So, critically examine how the displacement of tribal communities due to hydroelectric dams, uh, dam projects has affected the women in the local context illustrate with suitable ethnographic examples. So, it is not simply about the overall population, about the women population, those are also incorporated in your book. Women as special victims of uh, displacement and rehabilitation, especially with the river valley projects. Uh, we have good number of studies there indicating this particular thing, because uh, some students who were there in the test series batch, they were, they were asking how exactly to handle women centered thing, because I have told you time and again in the class that uh, the focus of the examiner has been, has been shifting towards women and specific regions of the country. So, even within the tribal problems, you need to give a higher attention to women. So, in the book, I have given a uh, good lot of uh, examples there, <coughs> so that uh, so, basically you are uh, going to write on the lines of, uh, you know, how the gender based violence is emerging, how the loss of uh, uh, women's rights are happening, how patri based societies are replacing matter based societies. So, on those lines you may perhaps.
talk about. Now, the other question that you have here is uh, the role of anthropology in nation building. Uh, what I suggest to you is, because not many of you have uh, read this type of a topic and uh, many of you were actually asking for some kind of a study material on this. So, I will be uh, you know sharing with you, <coughs> how it will be shared will be informed to you by the team, either in the description link or maybe perhaps uh, as a part of the telegram group, uh, we might be. But then uh, read this particular article that uh, I am sharing with you, that is um, <coughs> Nationalist Anthropology, Nation Building and how anthropology played a constructive role in that. Um, so, basically cultural studies, explanations of social dynamics, rights, movements, etc., how exactly they have helped. So, that particular write-up. So, in this, in this question paper, one write-up I am promising to you, that is um, nation building. You have the other ones. This is once again a very direct kind of a question, distribution of tribes in different uh, geographical regions. That is where you have uh, different writers, like Guha had does, done this, or Vidyarthi had done this, categorization of people, and Haddon had done this. So, you may perhaps use the three different references that are there, or you can stick to one of them. Uh, it would be more appreciated if you are able to list them all, and then perhaps depend on one like Guha for the geographical distribution of them. So, you give a map, in that map you give in different regions what tribes are there, and uh, from each of the regions you try to prepare a table of what kind of you know, uh, social institutions of uh, distinct identification are there, meaning uh, patri or matri based uh, societies, or what kind of uh, economic relations or reciprocities, their marriage reciprocity, or uh, economic reciprocity, cross-cultural, cross cross-tribal, and with the mainstream, what kind of relationships they are having. Uh, or maybe perhaps when it comes to customary law, which regions are having that customary law, and uh, where exactly there is more incidence of totemism and clan based institutions. That is where, uh, you know, we see the prevalence of naturism, totemism, bongaism, etc. So, basically, uh, that, is, that is where classification you take from any one of them. And the explanation of each region, what kind of special characteristics are there, LP Vidyarthi's uh, explanation can be used. And uh, you are not simply you are not simply stopping there. In the concluding remarks, you may have to talk about how these distinct institutions are uh, either subject to ethnocide or they are getting assimilation, assimilated based on the culture contact, especially with the mainstream and the role of the governments uh, uh, in integrationism kind of things. You have uh, the other couple of uh, questions here. So, people were rather celebrating writing answers to these questions. S. C. Roy, somebody who was uh, one of the earliest Indian anthropologists to have uh, produced uh, the first ethnograph by any Indian author, that is the Ho. Uh, so, maybe perhaps you can begin with that and how diversified his work was how he you know, contributed to both theory and, uh, and practice. It is not simply book view that he had given, it was the field view in combination with the book view that he had uh, contributed. So, <coughs> that is where you, know, you may perhaps uh, elaborate more on what he had advocated for uh, indigenous people's rights. Uh, apart from giving ethnographic uh, researchers, training people, huge number of them uh, from Indian anthropology. So, he more or less looks like a, like a Franz Boas of uh, uh, European anthropology. So, you can see a mirror image in him. 
So, that is how things are. Mm. We see that uh, there is one element here, the element of getting tired, because too much of content is there to be written, huge volume of content. And uh, um, somebody was saying, it looked like a general kind of a question paper, but that is a major mistake that you are doing. It is not a general kind of a question paper, it is much more specific. You have specific examples, specific studies, so kind of things. And one other question that I would be adding to your document is, uh, how Indus Valley was the first um, settlement of the big civilization, that I will be adding uh, to your description. Uh, so, that is where I am actually closing, mm, looking forward to help you out throughout the upcoming year. And those of you who are writing main exam next year, mm, make use of our services. Uh, <coughs> and uh, whatever, if you have written the exam this year, and uh, uh, based on the level of satisfaction or dissatisfaction, you think that you need my help. It, at any point of time, you just feel free to come over uh, and talk to me, meet me, and see in what best ways I will be able to help you out. And those of you who have written main this year, and who would be, uh, by God's grace, clearing the main exam and getting uh, the uh, call for the interview, uh, kindly once again, try using my services to be a part of your journey in UPSC. So, have a great, great time ahead. Thank you so much.